Hi, welcome to another episode of Luncheonette with Laura Diaz. That's me, and I'm so excited to bring this show to you today. I'm going to be talking with Robin Jensen, and we're going to be discussing how to effectively communicate and advocate for the dependent children in your home. So it's a great topic, and it's something I think we can all learn a lot from what she has to share with us. But first, I have a few announcements. We are posting very soon, so keep an eye on the website, our video on pool safety. This is a video that we wanted to update and make sure that you guys are ready for those summer months and keeping the children safe. So keep an eye on our website and you know that's at www.jitfl.com. We're going to post that on the screen so you can write it down and just watch for the um, just posted videos. Also, we're so excited. As you know, we've had um, a lot of shows in the past that we've talked about how we've been involved in legislation changes. And one of the key things that we've been working on here at QPI, and I know that a lot of people across the state has been, is the new legislation regarding the independent living. And we're so excited that that legislation has passed and that there's going to be a lot of changes that are going to benefit our young people in care. So um, hopefully you've seen some articles and we're going to keep you posted more on that and how it's going to change um, the, really the world of foster parenting because we're going to be looking to recruit more teen foster parents and really help those young people transition into adulthood so it's a wonderful thing and we're just excited about it so without further ado I want to introduce to you Robin Jensen hi Robin hi how are you great Robin is the managing attorney for circuit 12 and she is also the assistant statewide training director and she's going to like I said talk to you about you know communication and advocating for children absolutely thank you and I appreciate everyone joining us today we're going to talk about why is this important for children for advocating for dependent children and it's important because we all care so much about the safety of these children and making sure that they get permanent connections now most of you, especially newer foster parents that are involved, ta we talk about acronyms. We deal in a world in dependency that's all acronyms. Oh yeah, we know about those acronyms. CBC, CLS, DCF. <laughs> ALPA. Um, we, and we have new acronyms coming, which is always exciting, <laughs> right? So I could give you a sentence that's almost all acronyms. CLS met with OPA and CBC to identify POC for CPT and SAMH regarding FSDMM, OHC, and FSFN. Is that ridiculous? It's ridiculous. It is. <laughs> My new attorneys get six pages of acronyms to help them meander their way through the system. Well, I learn new acronyms every day, but that's just one example of the different languages we speak really to effectively communicate, and this is a quote by Anthony Robbins, I'm glad he um, agrees with me, <laughs> um, we must realize that we're all different in the way we perceive the world. And we use this understanding as our guide to effectively communicate, but it's a two-edged sword. What we really need to do is we need to effectively convey our message, but also we need to take in other people's uh, perspectives, their opinions in that. Some of the differences we have, and all of you guys know this, I'm not telling anybody anything new, it's just something that you need to think about. Um, age, gender, education, experience, geography, personality, what about ego? Mm -hmm. You think that plays a role in how we communicate? Absolutely. It does. Mm -hmm. Really the lack of effective communication is virtually, um, is at the bottom of virtually every misunderstanding. People make assumptions and generalize. The audience, you look at me when I walk in and you make an assumption based on maybe my age, mm -hmm. what you perceive to be my experience. Well, we're gonna talk about that a little bit. First of all, I'd like to talk about generational differences because they are different. We have the silent generation, which is ages 71 to 88. In this area, who would you think would be in the silent generation? Um, that would pertain to our case. I would say we might have a grandparent of the Absolutely. child, maybe even a guardian ad litem. We have several in our area. We have several guardian ad litems that are, you know, elderly people giving back. So there might be a few involved. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, we have baby boomers, which are ages 49 to 70. That's a huge range of age. <laughs> <laughs> I'm at the very, very tip of that, so. <laughs> um, we have Generation X, which is ages 34 to 48. 
Now what's funny is even though I'm a baby boomer, I'm at the one end of that baby boomer generation, I identify a little bit more with mm -hmm. Generation X. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'd like to think so. <laughs> There's Generation Y, which is the Millennials, mm -hmm. okay, ages 13 to 33. Again, a wide span. Who might that be? Well, that could be the child in our home. That could be the biological parent in our home, and it most, most likely is our case manager. And when I was doing a little bit of research on this, I found out that they haven't exactly named the next generation. It's either Generation Z, how creative is that, Z, or the global generation because they're more concerned. I mean, everything globally is being brought into your home. So those are the different generations, and you need to understand who's sitting at the table, especially foster parents come to a lot of staffings, mm -hmm. and they're they could be dealing with the gamut of all of those generations. The silent generation, um, who are you and how you communicate? Your communication preferences might be memos and letters, some of the assets that you bring to the table, you're dedicated, experienced, and knowledgeable. There's some challenges, however. Um, you may be uncomfortable with conflict, and you rarely challenge authority. Now, is that always the case? No, but that's a generational stereotype. And if you look at some of the things that happened in the silent generation, you understand, because think of some of the world events that happened at that point in time. You have the Hindenburg, you have World War II. What were the messages of that generation? It was stay in line, consider the common good, make do or make make do without. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's a huge difference when you compare that with baby boomers. What do they like to work with? They like to communicate in person. See, that's not me. You may generalize that with me. Um, what are some of the assets? They're team oriented, they're dedicated and knowledgeable. Challenges, they may put process ahead of, a, of results. Are they budget minded? Not necessarily. And we all know that. Now let's talk about Gen X. Um, 34 to 48, huge, huge group of people that we deal with. Um, they like direct and immediate communication. Probably no surprise. Their assets are they're adaptable, independent, creative, and they challenge the system. So think about that when you're dealing with that generation. And let's talk about the millennials ages 13 to 33. That's a huge spread, 13 to 30. I'm just Some trying to imagine kids. a 13 year old communicating like a 33 year old is gonna be very different. Some of my attorneys, mm -hmm. my junior attorneys are in this age bracket. Mm -hmm. And think about what the messages of their generation were. Columbine massacre, 9-11, social networking, comes into play, think about how that has changed how we communicate. Their messages in the millennial generation is you are special. You know, everybody gets an award for just showing up, uh, which drives my generation a little crazy, but that's okay. <laughs> Serve your community. Yeah, we had to earn it back yeah, then, right. didn't we? <laughs> you didn't just show up, you earned it. <laughs> yes, exactly. You connect 24-7, mm -hmm. but yet they're very collaborative. They're entitled, mm -hmm. sociable, and civic-minded. Now, I can tell you I have about four attorneys that are in this age group. Some are exactly like this, some are not at all. So it just depends. Don't make stereotypes, everyone's different. Now, let's add to generational issues, your role in child welfare. We have attorneys, we have the child protection team, we have the investigators, we have guardian ad litems, foster parents, case managers, relatives, law enforcement, um, who did I forget? Judges. Judges. <laughs> the children. The children themselves. Right. We have a lot of different people that we deal with. I mean, can we make it any more complicated when we're sitting around a table at a staffing and we have 5, 10, 15 people in that staffing? Think of how difficult it is. Another factor that comes into communicating are differences in child welfare standards. Mm -hmm. Best interest. Everybody should always be thinking of best interest. Do parents' attorneys think of best interest? I think most of them honestly really try to, but they have a different role. They have to zealously advocate for their client, which is the parent. Well, and could they be thinking of the best interest of the parent sometimes versus what someone else may consider is the best interest of the child? Absolutely. I mean, as you know, as a foster parent, you're with kids 24-7. Mm -hmm. So many times, people forget the role you play and how well you know these kids. You, you're our best 
witness really to what is going on in that child's life. When we come into court, we need to be talking to you as attorneys. We want to get that information from you. Um, we have statutes that come into play. We have case law that interprets those statutes because sometimes what a statute says is not necessarily what it means in its entirety. Um, we have safety issues. We have risk assessments. And then we have the reasonable person standard. Believe it or not, it's there. So let's, let's get into some of these roles because they're all um, very different. So as Children's Legal Services, the attorneys that come in, we represent the state of Florida, but we're, um, our task is to drive our cases to do what's best for children. We wanna make sure they get permanency as quickly as possible, but we have to be cognizant of statutes, mm -hmm. of case law, evidence, Sometimes getting evidence in is very difficult. Very difficult. You know, Aunt Susie mm -hmm. heard from Uncle George that lives three states away that mom was passed out and under the influence. Right. How are we going to bring right. that into court? Right. We all may know it's true, but mm -hmm. it becomes very difficult when the attorney comes in and says, well, that's great, but I can't prove that in court. Right. Um, we have a burden of proof. We have a certain level of standard that we have to meet depending on what stage of the proceedings we are. Uh, do we always like the answer? From the attorney's standpoint, it's very difficult sometimes because we don't always like the answer that we have to give. That's funny when you say that because one of the things I learned early on in my foster parent journey was legal sufficiency. And it was understanding that even though it looks like and, and I have this feeling or you know we're concerned, you know, we still have a real true legal court case and you have to prove these things in the court of law. So it was a definitely an eye opener for me when I first became a foster parent. Right, because you think, okay, the judge wants to know every possible thing, shouldn't mm -hmm. we just tell him everything? Mm -hmm. But again, we have to abide by these rules. And legal, even though we may say that we don't have enough to move forward for termination of parental rights or enough to do something, it doesn't mean that we necessarily like it or that we agree with it, but it's the law. So that's something to consider when Children's Legal Services is at the table. Now what about the guardian ad litem? They're advocating for the best interest of the child. They're coming from a different perspective. Again, we've got guardian ad litem supervisors. We have guardian ad litem volunteers mm -hmm. that bring another aspect. And their attorneys. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> but what I like people to do is open their minds. Don't close your mind when you're at that table. Mm -hmm. Most of our guardian ad litem volunteers there, there are retired people. Some of them are nurses, some of them are doctors. There's firemen, there's law enforcement. There are guardian ad litems that have also been foster parents. Mm -hmm. So don't discount what they have to say. Um, what is it important to know when you're dealing with a guardian ad litem? How are you going to present something to them and what are you going to consider when they're presenting it to you? Do you look at them and say, well, you're retired, you're out of the workforce and therefore you don't know what's going on? Of course not, you're not gonna do that. Um, a lot of them, I'm fascinated by people's backgrounds. It's something that maybe it's the older I get, but everybody has a story. Everybody comes from somewhere and they have their experiences that they bring into their perspective. Um, case managers, most of them are very young. A lot of them come out of school. Mm -hmm. But don't ever discount the fact that because a case manager or somebody else is young that they don't bring life experience. Mm -hmm. Most case managers to me look look very young. I'm very Maybe very, 12. Yes. <laughs> very <laughs> Some young. of my attorneys look 12. <laughs> but you know, and I joke around because, but, it, but it's very serious mm -hmm, because I is. have actually put case managers on the stand that are under the age of 30, mm -hmm. but yet they might have raised their siblings. I put a case manager on the stand one time that a parent attorney said, well, what do you know about ages and stages? He said, well, I raised eight of my siblings. My parents were never around. Then my father died. He could tell you ages and stages better than most, most wow. parents could. Mm -hmm. So don't discount that experience mm -hmm. they bring. Mm -hmm. um, well, not to mention all the schooling they've been through. And a absolutely. lot of them are very, very passionate. And they get into this field because they want to advocate for children. Correct. Mm -hmm. Um, and CPT, the child protection team, you know, they have certain procedures, there's statutes that they have to follow, and there's rules that they have to go by. They go in and they interview the child. You hope, don't assume that they know everything else in the case because we try to give them as full account of the information as possible. Sometimes we call them and say, why did you come up with this conclusion? 
and we find out that maybe they don't know everything. So things to consider, caseloads. As foster parents, you might want to consider some of the caseloads. Not that that's ever an excuse, and I'm not advocating for that, but attorneys, we have under 80 cases, but that's a lot of cases. It's a lot of cases to keep track of. Case managers have quite a bit of caseload. They're very busy. Sometimes I have to tell people, don't tell me names, give me facts. I can't remember. I have 11 attorneys working for me, and there are about seven, 800 cases in my circuit. So wow. it's very difficult for me to track on a case unless I hear a nugget of facts. So it may seem to you that maybe I don't know everything about the case and why, why don't I because I'm the managing attorney, but consider that. I wouldn't expect you to memorize 800 cases. <laughs> and, you know, and I that would can't. be hard. I can't. Um, yeah. Think about judges. Mm -hmm. Think about a judge. A judge has all of the cases before him in dependency, and then depending on what county you're in, they may cover another area, like delinquency. So mm -hmm. when you think maybe the judge is being callous or doesn't know and why don't they know, that's our job to go in there and make sure they know. So a lot of times you'll find when you go to court, and we love foster parents to go to court, is think about what um, the Children's Legal Services attorney is saying, they're trying to give them a little bit of background again to jog their memory. Um, well, so I, I have think to about tell that. you that what, what you're saying is so important and um, it's interesting that we have seen such a huge shift in communication with the, the CLS attorneys because I can tell you when I first started out, we were like, you're not allowed to talk to them. <laughs> no, I'm serious. And, it's like, and, and, and I can tell you now, uh, in in my recent case, the attorney would call me before going to court. Is there something, Laura, you think I should know? And I would tell him, he's like, oh, I'm so glad you told me all this, you know. So not that the case manager didn't intend to tell him, but, you know, they're busy, right. many cases. And, and like you said, the whole thing in advocating does come down to us communicating together so that you can bring pertinent, important data to the judge because he isn't going to know. He's not in your home. He doesn't talk to the kids on a day-to-day -day basis. So Absolutely. And the CLS attorney should be calling the foster parents because, like I said, you're our best witness in our case. So in our circuit, another thing we do is the foster parents have all of our email, all of our BlackBerry numbers, all of the, the caseload distribution. We send that out a couple times a month. They know the upcoming court dates, and we're always encouraging you to bring information to us. Like I said, you are with that child 24-7. Please tell us because we may not know everything you do. And along those lines, you tell a case manager. The case manager is also talking to service providers. The case manager is also talking to us. The case manager is talking to relatives. They may be talking to a wide variety of people. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you tell the, the same story again and again, pretty soon you shorten it mm -hmm. a little bit yes, each time. True. I do that. Mm -hmm. So it's not an intentional oversight. Right. It, it's just a matter of making sure that you're communicating. Mm -hmm. What do you suggest, Robin, really quick, when, when a foster parent cannot attend court? Um, do you, from the attorney's perspective, like them to kind of write something up with all the information or to just have that verbal conversation? Either way, mm -hmm. whatever, whatever works best. Mm -hmm. I know foster parents are busy. Mm -hmm. um, in, in our circuit, we have um, input form, mm -hmm. caregiver input form. Mm -hmm. We actually send that out to foster parents and we encourage you. We know that you're busy, but the more information you can put on that, some key things that maybe we need to know, mm -hmm. Um, a call would be great. We're supposed to be calling you. Email, whatever you prefer. I communicate a lot in email, regardless of what my generation says I like to do, um, because it's We're very easy. We're becoming more techie these oh, days. Oh, I know, I we, know. We've had to catch up with the uh, Gen X. I know, the Gen <laughs> Xs and the Millennials and everyone else. But seriously, though, if you give us that information, some foster parents we've asked, they want to be contacted by email. In fact, we've um, sent out a, kind of like a survey to, to like feelers preferred, to figure out. contact. That's why yeah. we email, mm -hmm. so it works for us. Mm -hmm. um, Conversations are great. Sometimes I like an email because I like to print it out and have it with me to refer to and when I'm preparing for trial or upcoming hearings. So there's a lot of different information that everybody has. I don't want anybody to think, to go into a staffing and think, oh, the CLS attorney is too busy, the case manager is too busy, or, or think of their perspective. You know, I learn things every day from my new attorneys. Mm -hmm. And I have been practicing a long time, despite my young age. Um, so 
don't assume that somebody knows. Mm -hmm. Don't assume that they're coming at you from a certain perspective. Mm -hmm. Just share. Mm -hmm. And there's value in the collaboration. Is what it sounds like to me. You're saying is like when we get everybody at the table and they honestly share, it, you know, in the right way. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, in a way that con communicates to all the different people and personalities and ages and you know genders and all those things. You know, that collaboration could be really very, very meaningful and, and help the case go along. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I should insert a little tiny disclaimer here because I am an attorney, but I use I always use situations and examples. I use myself, I use my staff, I use people. I just I'm an equal opportunity um, I don't want to say Offender. Example. <laughs> Offender. There you go. Offender. Well, because you, you know we, what? we all know the attorney <laughs> jokes. Oh, yeah. I usually <laughs> combine the attorney and case manager jokes. But, yeah. But you got to get rid of your ego. Mm -hmm. And absolutely, I'm a litigator. I should have a little bit of an ego. Mm -hmm. you, want, you want an attorney in there that has oh, yeah. a little bit of an ego. Mm -hmm. I like to win, but at the same time, it's not about winning for us. It's about doing what's best for children. Yes. Surprise. Mm -hmm. I've been wrong on occasion. No. I have. Surprise, foster parents have been wrong. Mm -hmm. Case managers have been wrong. Guardians have been wrong. Everybody has been wrong. It's not an ego thing. It's let's discuss and do right. what's right for right. kids. So we have all this information. We have generational. We have your perspective, mm -hmm. your role in child welfare, and what do we do with all of this information? Because it is. There's a lot of information to take in. And first of all, of course, we talked about it, be aware of who your audience is. Because again, you want to convey yourself and think about the best manner that you open their mind to right. listen to you. Right. So does it work when you have your hands crossed? No. Does it work when you're sitting at a staffing and you're sitting back and you're looking at your emails? What information does that convey to your list? They're, that person knows you're not paying attention. Right. That person knows they're not important. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not just your words. It's your body language. It's your tone. You can say the same words in a nice tone and really have people listen to you as opposed to um, some of the harsh tones I've heard in staffings. Um, and yes, I have heard of those. I've been in a staffing where everybody has started screaming. Um, I was in a staffing once and literally these children were already freed for adoption. Okay, Rights have been terminated. We had foster parents, we had therapists, we had every single possible person that was involved in these children's lives and we were screaming at one another. It's, of course I wasn't doing that, but foster parent, guardian, therapist, everybody was so passionate yeah. about these children and finally I got to the point and I sat there and I looked at everybody and I said isn't this wonderful and they looked at me like I was crazy I said think these two children have a room full of people that are so yeah, passionate true. about what they do mm -hmm. and how what happens to these children that we're yelling at one another mm -hmm. but we all want the best for them and once everybody yeah. looked at me and said you know what if you look at things think about how I changed that staffing Think about how the tone changed. Now everybody is saying, you're, yeah, right. you're right. This is kind of cool that yeah. we're all here. <laughs> yeah. Everybody calmed down a little mm -hmm. bit and maybe we were get, we, we were, um, people started listening more. So just something to consider when you're in those staffings mm -hmm. and everybody has their back well, up looking, against looking the wall. Looking a little bit about at what everybody else's motivation is in the room and like, you know, hey, we all got into this and we're all part of this to, you know, look at the child's best interests. Absolutely, mm -hmm. think of these parents. Mm -hmm. They're in this room, in a staffing. All these people are sitting here discussing what's gonna happen with them and their children, and we kind of get mad at them because they're not cooperative, or they're mad at us. We've removed their children and we're telling them what to do. Mm -hmm. Think of their perspective. Right. You know, we're in their lives usually because they don't have that um, wonderful support network or they haven't been raised the way some of us have. I mean, just think about their perspective and what they're feeling when we're in, it, we're in there telling them what to do. It makes a big difference. It, it really does. does. Um, get rid of your ego. Did I say that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's it's an true. important point though, everybody, right? <laughs> everybody does have egos because it, it's important to us to be heard. It's, a, it's, it's human nature. 
but um, to have our way to right, win. Right, to have your way to yeah. win. Mm -hmm. um, I won't give you some of my war stories, but you know, <laughs> I've learned at times the hard way because, you know, like I said, I want to win my case. Mm -hmm. I'm a litigator. I want to do what's best for these children. And you can be wrong sometimes. Yeah. So you got to you got to step back and say, you know what? I hadn't thought about that. Um, I have had many investigators come into me, make me sit down, bring the documents and say, I don't think you've given this enough um, attention. Right. Sometimes we have to listen to the other perspectives before we, you know, kind of make a final conclusion. But sometimes I think we jump to the conclusion based on little pieces of what we get. And then once we hear all the facts, it's easier to say, whoa, okay. It's those instant decisions that we make there's been studies on it I'm, I'm fascinated by the human mind but really those instant gut reactions are not really gut reactions what they are is you're drawing from your life experience mm -hmm. and your um, knowledge your education all of the things that we talked about and you come to that conclusion and your body tells you as a human I need to come to this conclusion pretty quickly mm -hmm. because I'm busy because I have another staffing. So true. Think about what it means to a child, for those of you we talked about, the teenagers. Think about the message you're giving to a teenager. When you're sitting in a staffing with them, and I'm looking at my watch, I'm yeah, busy. They're not, their life isn't as important It turns to you. them off. Absolutely. They're a teenager, and pretty mm -hmm. soon they say, why did she look at, why are they looking at their mm -hmm. watch? Why are they checking their emails? So, right. so something, true. Absolutely true. something to consider. And think of what is important to that person. Mm -hmm. I have met with a lot of foster parents. I have met with foster parents when they didn't understand why we weren't moving, for example, the termination of parental rights. Explaining the whole dynamic and how we wanted it to be a good case or, or whatever the dynamics was of the particular case, it helps them. They needed to understand. So, and we as attorneys need to do a better job of explaining when we, when we reach our conclusions because not everybody's been trained like us mm -hmm. to look at things like that. Your words. Mm -hmm. Has anybody ever been in a staffing where you said, don't be ridiculous? Yes. Yeah, or don't be ridiculous? Mm -hmm. um, I hope you're happy. That happened to me not too long ago because I was giving a legal opinion. And I, wa I wasn't happy or sad. It was I was trying to give the opinion. They got angry, mm -hmm. and then that shut down communication. Mm -hmm. um, you have been doing this long enough to know better, or you haven't been doing this long, have you? Either way, you know, you can use that both ways. Exactly. Or really, really can be set on. <laughs> yeah. Really? E either way, that's <laughs> going to put somebody off. <laughs> either with a question mark yeah. or an explanation. So, um, but consider, consider statements like this. I really need to understand what you're telling right. me, and maybe I'm not understanding the full impact. Mm -hmm. Or, okay. You need to start from the beginning. You say you're concerned. I need to know what's behind those concerns. So help me, help me understand. How did you come to that conclusion? Mm -hmm. What makes you think this child isn't safe? Mm -hmm. And usually I will tell people, foster parents or whomever, I need specifics. Mm -hmm. You hear legal always tell you, well, I need evidence. Right. More than concerns. Those concerns are based on something. And sometimes it's just not articulating really what we need to know. Right. It's just, it's, I'm concerned because your mind has formed a conclusion mm -hmm. based on these, the safety or risk factors. So you just need to articulate yeah, it Yeah, let's get to the bottom of this. Absolutely. And, right. Absolutely. Because maybe there's a nugget down there that's really critical for everybody to understand. You know? Right. A lot of times I tell people, you know what, maybe I'm wrong. Please tell me mm -hmm. why. And sometimes when you put yourself in that position and you make yourself wrong, that person all of a sudden thinks, oh, wow, this is kind of cool. They've already admitted they're wrong, so maybe I can give them some well, more. Well, you know, I think a lot of times when they come in with that attitude, like you were just talking about, they're expecting confrontation. They're expecting conflict. But when they hear somebody across the table, especially an attorney who they're probably already intimidated, you know, right, I mean, let's right. be honest. 
you know, foster parents, especially when you're new, the attorneys, the judges, you know, it's, it's a new world mm -hmm. and it's intimidating. So they feel like, oh, you know, and they think I don't know anything or they, they make these conclusions, tr you know, obviously not founded, but just in their own insecurities, maybe in intimidation. And then they say, oh, well, when you say help me to understand, oh, well, they're not here to come against me. They really want to hear from me. And it's right. being able to draw that information out. Right, and it is intimidating going mm -hmm. to court, mm -hmm. and there's so many people involved, but you know, you, ne you need to try, mm -hmm. because think about it. Think of what you bring as a foster parent. I hear foster parents all the time. I go to foster parent meetings, and they're saying six, seven kids, or I've had 20 kids go through my home, and I'm thinking, I can barely take care of one child. <laughs> my hats are off to you, because oh, yeah, it is amazing. It I is mean, amazing. I've seen one foster mm -hmm. family adopt eight children, mm -hmm. you know, and they had four of their own. So I'm just saying, um, but you know, bringing it back to communication, listen, that's, that's key is listen. Focus mm -hmm. fully on the speaker, active listening. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you need to repeat what that person said to you. Right. Um, ask a question, mm -hmm. definitely ask questions because then again, what are you saying to the person who's telling you the information? Mm -hmm. I'm valuing your input so Absolutely. it opens it up. Well now, it looks like we're out of time, Robin. This has been a wonderful conversation and I think so important for foster parents out there. And listen guys, we have attached Robin's PowerPoint, so feel free to download it, to take a look at it. And um, we're, just, we're just thrilled that she was able to share this information. And do you have a few parting comments that you'd like and just a wrap up for our viewers, something you'd like to share with them about it? Absolutely, you know, attorneys can talk forever, but you know, I just wanna say, you. Foster parents are appreciated. I know you're not told enough by the system, you're not told by individuals in the system, but you are appreciated. Don't forget the power that you have in a child's life. You have the power to really change things for them. And I appreciate you bringing me on today. It's been no, I thank you a for great coming. time. Thank, thank you for you. coming and sharing. So guys, thank you for joining us with another episode of Luncheonette. And just a reminder that we would love to hear from you. This show is for you. So go to our Facebook page. It's Just In Time Training. Or also email us. And we're going to post the email address here. And just if you have any topics you'd like us to run, if you have any questions for upcoming um, episodes when we, when we post those, or um, any other suggestions, we want to hear from you. Thanks again. We look forward to seeing you next time.